Ms. Fraser Butlin, I think the next witness would like to be known as Joan. She does, she? yes. Could Joan come forward, please? Please state your full name. I'm Joan Rose Edgington. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely... I do solemnly, sincerely... And truly declare and affirm... And truly declare and affirm... That the evidence I shall give... That the evidence I shall give... Shall be the truth... Shall be the truth... The whole truth... The whole truth... And nothing but the truth... And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Joan, you <coughs> trained originally to be a secondary school teacher, didn't I you? I did, yes. Then in about 1987, you became a youth worker mm-hmm. and then a centre manager. Yep. And in 1989, you started a mountain leadership course. I did. And became part of the Outward Bound team. Yes. My original degree was a geography degree. I joined the Somerset Youth Team and landed up with a gruff phone call from somebody saying, I assume you can read maps. (laughs) Do you like the outdoors? And that's how that bit started. Can you describe for us your level of fitness at that point in your life? As the only female member of the team, um, I'd been recruited because we had girls interested in joining the Outward Band, but they needed a female member. I was able to, and did, maintain the same effort... Um, work ethic and hours as any of the men. That includes climbing, um, kit, carrying kit, and working 24-7 with young people because that's what you do when you're outdoors. And when you were outdoors, what kind of activities were you leading? Um, It was a mix, but the whole point really was for young people, sometimes for the first time, to get a chance to experience the outdoors. So we worked at their level. Sometimes for them it was the first time they'd walked the countryside. Some were on their way to becoming quite advanced climbers. Um, Once or twice we included water aspects, you know, river swimming and things. So you name it, we tried it. (laughs) And then all of that changed in December 1990. Yes. When you were admitted to hospital with ulcerative colitis. Well, 1991. I understand that in nine, January 1991, you underwent surgery yeah. because the steroids weren't able to get on top of the colitis. Yeah. I'd, we'd come back from a field trip that summer in the Dolomites, and from one campsite, we'd all landed up with a tummy infection, and just basically it didn't settle over the winter. And... Um, My GP at the time did wonder if it was ulcerative colitis, but I'd had no history of any medical problems up until then. So you underwent a colectomy, removal of your colon? Yes. (laughs) um, The steroids didn't settle the bleeding. We had Christmas as a holiday, and I was meant to rest. The bleeding got to the point where basically an ambulance had to turn up after Christmas and take me into hospital. I was on a medical ward, um, and I forget the dates, to be honest, but a long time, and they upped the steroids and were waiting for things to settle. In the end, it became apparent, I think it was after a good month, that it wasn't going to work, and I was transferred to the surgical ward under Mr Collins, who was excellent. Um, But by then, my colon was so damaged, it had to be totally removed. And during that surgery, you received uh, substantial quantities of whole blood. Yes. Prior to the surgery, were you made aware of any risks involved in receiving a blood transfusion? No. And was there any discussion after the surgery of any possible risks of infection? No. Uh, you say uh, in your witness statement uh, that you now understand but, but that by the time I had my blood, blood transfusion, there was a screening test for blood, but it wasn't being used. There was a risk of infection and I wasn't informed. I believe that the risks of the blood transfusion should have been discussed with me at the point that major surgery was being considered. My understanding is that there were safe products that could have been used during surgery instead of giving me a blood transfusion, that these would have cost the NHS 
more money. Yeah, Is absolutely. Is that still your understanding? Yes. And actually, I just, for the first time, saw my medical notes about a week ago, and I realised I also had transfusions before surgery because I was so weak. They had to build me up, so I actually had transfusions on several occasions. And you were then um, unable to work for about two years after that surgery. Yes. And you had some difficulties with the child support agency and you were campaigning against them in relation to some payments uh, that you didn't want your husband, your ex-husband, to, to make to yes. you. By 1994, you, though, had managed to return to full-time work. Is that right? Yes. Um, before I was ill, um, I'd been... I'm not quite sure, contributing to the Somerset Youth Service um, on lots of levels. I was part of a forum. I was part of training team. And um, when word got out within our network that I was regaining strength and fitness, because I was, there's an interim bit. In the recovery from the surgery, I left the hospital so weak and underweight because I'd been in for three months, basically bed rest. I'd lost muscle tone. Um, and my style is to just roll your sleeves up, sort it out. I went to homeopathy. Um, I was building up muscle tone. I was getting fit. And really felt I was on the road to recovery. There were issues about stamina that I couldn't quite pin down, didn't quite know. And then I just thought, well, that's because my body's been through quite a trauma. Um, it'll come back. But then in all of this and being seen out walking and everything else, some friends said she's up and running again. And it was actually the county officer that approached me and said, would I work again? And you managed that for a little bit of time, but then your health deteriorated again. It was a full-on job managing a large youth centre that had had quite a few problems. So some of my working days started at 9 and finished at 12. Not often, but that was the process, that if you were supporting an evening session when the youth club was open, by the time I'd driven home, it was really late. So you're operating on lots of levels. There was the physical demand... There was this sort of intellectual planning, meeting with committees, meeting with politicians, looking for funding. Um, but what were your symptoms at that point, just before 1995? Um, I think, in many ways, it'll sound daft, but I felt quite lucky with retrospect that I had gone to a homeopath because I was paying more attention than most people would because I had been extremely fit and used to working through Keep Fit programs, I think I was more aware than most people would be. And I became aware that if I pushed it, if I got tired, um, flu-like symptoms would be generated with no sense of having caught a cold. Um, the, the sort of wanting to rest up at the weekend normally if I had a nice weekend off I'd bounce back and be ready for Monday and that that old familiar pattern just wasn't happening. You've described it as having general flu-like symptoms, aches and pains and fatigue. There's tired and then there's ill tired. Sleep wouldn't cure it. My lymph glands in my neck and armpits would flare up if I pushed myself too hard my body seemed to overreact to coughs and colds and my glands would swell for no apparent reason when I was tired. I'd been very resilient before the blood transfusion. Exactly. Yeah. Then in, nine, in June 1995, you received a letter from the South West Blood Transfusion Service as part of a look-back exercise. Yeah. Paul, could we have document 0065002, please? And in this uh, letter, if you just go down to the... Thank you. Uh, in this letter, you were told that the transfusion you'd received may have been carrying the hepatitis C virus. What did you do when you received that letter? Um, I 
I'm assuming, and I can't find, that there was a contact number. Um, I have a memory of having a number to phone to make an appointment. I, I think you may find it's there. You look at the letter. Um, the the paragraph top. second before last, which has got the letters G R O C over it. Oh, I see. Thank Please you. Please contact yes. myself on. And for yes. legal reasons, that, that number's just been taken out. Thank you. <laughs> so your memory is absolutely right. Thank you. Um, yes, so I made a phone call, um, which seemed to be, in my memory, just a general number, mm -hmm. and you were making a general appointment, so no big deal. Um, but I had to wait, again in my memory, well over a week for that appointment. Yes. And uh, you, you say in your statement, I think it's actually two weeks. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but it felt like a very long couple of weeks yes. that you were waiting. Yes. Um, There's so many layers to this when, when we're talking because I'm trying to remember what it was then and what I've learned since. Um, what it was then felt like a vacuum. Um, there wasn't much information around. I didn't even know what this thing was. Um, I wasn't sure what the process now was other than that I was making an appointment to go and see somebody. I didn't even know if that was for a blood test. I was just making an appointment. And how did you feel during that, those two weeks? It, it was a vacuum, but what was going through your mind? Um, the physical thing is just holding your breath. The mental process is um, all the what ifs, you know, would it, um, <coughs> thought I was getting well, what, what's this? So I think for that very first bit, until I had an appointment, um, I'm literally just physically and mentally holding my breath. Uh, you've said that you, you know you had to be alerted to the possibility of being infected by a letter or a phone call, yes. but you think it would have been better if you could have had an appointment much more quickly, perhaps within 24 hours, uh, than having to wait the two exactly, weeks. Exactly, because not only did you wait for that initial appointment, which then did mean I met actually with a clinician in a white coat, I can't tell you who it was, um, and a blood test, you know, a sample was taken, but then you also have to wait for the results. So I believe it was about a month went by before it was actually confirmed that I did have hep C. You've said that you attended that appointment two weeks uh, later. Uh, and what was the attitude of the person taking your blood? Um, my memory is that it, it, it was just an appointment. Um, very pleasant, very polite. My s assumption was that nothing's confirmed yet. This is just a process that you know, uh, retrospective, not quite sure what that means. I didn't then realise that if they've bothered to con contact you, it basically means you are infected. So I thought I was still yet to be confirmed. And then you went back for the results a, a week or a few weeks uh, later, and you were told you had a hepatitis C. Um, can you tell us how you were told? Um invited into a room, sat down the other side of a desk, uh, again, a doctor, um, <coughs> saying, you know, terribly sorry to have to confirm it is hep C. And I've realised whilst listening over this last week, there's an interesting <laughs> issue about the word counsel. Um, I've got my notes back now. And I truly believe that the clinician that saw me felt he had counselled me about it. I would use the word counsel as in informed. He informed me that um, about toothbrushes and razors um, and said it might mean I will need a liver biopsy. And that 
that was it. When you left that appointment, having been told you had hepatitis C, did you understand what the next steps were going to be for you? No. And I can absolutely say that because I remember sitting in the car park um, for a good half hour just not really trusting myself to drive and the only phrase going around my head was what now what's this what do I do um, I think and again I was pretty careful about keeping papers and things and I think I did leave with a leaflet in my hand and if it did then that was where I heard about the British liver foundation so I do believe they did do that but the overpowering feeling was just what now what now um, I should add to that at the time I was single parent very conscious I had two teenage daughters um, and all that goes with that the mortgage the job the the bills to be paid. We will certainly come to that uh, shortly. Thank you. <laughs> um, you also then went to see your GP. Um, yes. And what was their uh, response? What, what understanding did they have of hepatitis C? Um, nothing, really, is, is the short answer. The longer answer is met with um, kindness and concern. Um, and again, it, it, if I'm really honest, it, that chapter's quite a blur. But I was left with the impression that we were on cutting edge um, medical discovery, that um, whatever this thing was, um, there wasn't a lot of information to hand. And once I got through the initial shock of it all my normal pattern of survival kicked in and I was just trying to find out you know who what when do I need to talk to thank goodness for the internet although that has some drawbacks and that started a whole journey but in terms of your GP uh, you've said he was a kind and supportive GP but he was the first to admit that for him this was new ground yes and then, as you say, you uh, did uh, a lot of research yourself into the condition, uh, helped along by your GP, yes. pointing you towards relevant websites. Yes. Yeah. Uh, y you uh, were never referred to a hepatologist, uh, but were seen by the gastroenterologist who was seeing you in any event in relation to the colectomy at this stage. Yes. I, I actually realised that... Um, and it's funny how you forget these things. Until I saw the notes, um, I was between two hospitals in the end, Taunton, where I was originally operated on, Taunton, where I eventually had the treatment, and Yeovil, my local hospital. Um, within Taunton, the um, consultant I was referred to turned out to be the same gentleman whose ward I'd been on for a long time failing before I had surgery so that was tricky and when you attended those appointments you took a lot of questions with you didn't you I did and how was that received um, not very well <laughs> I, I genuinely think I approached it in my usual style which is quite open um, both my GP and my dad who at that time was a great support had counseled me to keep writing down questions as they popped into my head whilst waiting for the appointment that turned out to be quite a list and I had tried to resolve some of the questions myself but I went in to hopefully discuss my concerns uh, and what response did you receive um, when you went in with that list of questions again in absolute fairness to not only this particular gentleman, but where the whole system was at the time, I genuinely think they didn't have the answers to a lot of the questions I was asking. That was my impression. Um, 
I honestly can't remember what was said, but I did come away feeling that didn't go very well. And then since have found in my notes his wording which we're going to come to in just a moment. But before yeah. we go there, can you tell us some of just examples of some of the questions you were asking? Um, OK. Some of it was directly, you know, I've obviously been carrying this virus now for a period of time. I'm beginning to get information about um, its impact. There was, I think at the time, this phrase, slow burner. So to start off with the conversation, it was um, trying to be reassuring, I believe, and saying, yes, you know, people have lived with this for a long time. Um, and I was lucky to have been told early, and I do believe that's true. Um, but that stuck in my mind. Um, I was also asking about treatments, and I was also asking about the impact on my children. Um, you know, should they be tested? And um, well, it was a longer list than that, and I can't remember them all. That's okay. But you didn't particularly receive any answers to any of no. those questions. It, it was it was admitted that I could get my children tested, although. It, most probably wasn't necessary. Before we come to the letter uh, from uh, one of your treating doctors, I want to look at something first to uh, understand a little bit more of what your situation was at the time. Yeah. Uh, before we even go there, can you describe how you were feeling uh, in the sort of years of 95, 96 through to 98? What symptoms, physical symptoms, were you facing? Um... I work in images, so bear with. Some of them are quite simplistic, and I've heard other people use them, so it's universal. Partly trying to explain to my daughters, I, I found the um, image of a car. I'd got the car polished, it was fit, there was muscle tone, but if I put my foot on the accelerator, there was not the power there that used to be, and that was how I was trying to describe stamina. It's also the flat battery syndrome. Um, <sighs> aches and pains for no reason. Um, noticing joints were an issue, as I've said before, my glands swelling, stiff neck. Um, and the other thing, and I just hold on to this, and, and for me, it is a very specific thing. As a people-working person, one of the greatest skills, one of the greatest gifts you can give somebody is to remember their name. If you're working with young, disaffected teenagers who are used to being, or you, to be able to go up to them and say, hi, Chris, how's it going? How's the dog? Or whatever it was you remember about them. I was losing that facility, and I was putting that down to being tired. I've never really regained that facility in as much as I know that was a real skill, and I have worked at putting that back. I have to write it down now if I want to really remember somebody's name. You were involved in litigation concerning the blood transfusion subsequently, and some expert reports were written about you. I wonder if we can look at one of those now. It's document 0065010. And if we could go down to the third paragraph, which starts at uh, as far as her present health. It says there, although she found she wasn't able to recover her previous levels of stamina, she finds she gets cyclical symptoms, which essentially the major component of which is lack of energy and mild general uh, malaise. At times, these are associated with a range of further flu-like symptoms, failure of body temperature regulation, okay. some joint pain, dry skin. In addition to this, she suffers from low back pain, 
Uh, this is a pain in her lower back and shoulders, radiating to her legs on occasion. It's usually present when she wakes first thing in the morning. And then if we go to the next paragraph... She's able to do most things physically, but she's unable to cope with the fairly strenuous physical exertion she used to do as part and parcel of her life and career prior to these episodes. Is that what it was like? Yes. yes. And then if we go over the page to the final paragraph, the fact uh, just there. The fact that her liver is not particularly inflamed or scarred at the moment may indicate she has less of a chance of developing chronic liver disease in the future. I think her low back ache uh, are probably not related to hepatitis C. However, it is well known that a large proportion of patients with chronic hepatitis C virus infection do suffer from quite profound general malaise and lack of energy. The cyclical nature of these symptoms in Mrs Taylor and the fact that she is otherwise a very sensible lady who clearly does try to push herself to the best of her ability would lead me to suspect that these symptoms are related to a continuing viral infection. That view wasn't accepted, as you've alluded to, by others who were treating you, was it? Um, it's really difficult to shuffle the time zones. But it did feel that if you were talking to a specialist versus a non-specialist, there was quite a gap in the understanding. I think that's fair to say. <laughs> And you said it wasn't just a gap in understanding, it was also a gap in attitude. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Can we look at 00065008, please? And the third paragraph, she expressed herself. Thank you. Uh, she expressed herself rather put out that I do not attach such importance to her non-specific symptoms as to have reported them uh, to some central authority responsible for hepatitis C. I've explained to her that her symptoms are very non-specific and of low discriminant value, probably occurring in up to 30% of most patients with most diseases attending my clinics. Uh, that's what was written to your GP, um, at the time unbeknownst to you. Absolutely. Uh, but I think you've said that was representative of the attitude that you were facing at this time. And it's interesting to see... The response to my list, um, that top one, she was emotionally a bit more stable, although still very intense. That means I came in with a list of questions. <laughs> How did it make you feel when you attended those appointments and were faced with that attitude? If I hadn't had a really kind, caring GP, I would have really struggled. Because at the time, the information on the net wasn't that brilliant either. Um, and it was very easy to get drawn into chat groups that were being extremely negative. Um, yeah, thank goodness for my GP. Having obtained your records recently, uh, you've also found a, another letter. Could we have up 00065009, please? This letter is dated the 3rd of July, 1998. Do you mind? Can I... I hang on to thoughts rather of fragilely. Um, of course. And I was going to save it to the end... But Sir Brian, <laughs> um, it's going now because it's important. Let me look at my notes. <laughs> Part of the thing that I have continued to struggle with is the so called non specific symptoms. I totally understand that a medical professional person cannot take action until there is clinical evidence. What I'm beginning to understand is if nobody is recording 
all our non-specific post-treatment, post-infection symptoms, there never will be any clinical evidence. So there's a whole bunch of us out there going to specialists, going to different departments, trying to describe our symptoms over and over again, only to have, quite rightly, these physicians saying, well, it isn't whatever their specialty is, I can't help you. So I personally, over the last few years, have been to rheumatology. I do not have lupus. Thank you. I didn't think I did. I was under, uh, no, yeah, rheumatology. I was under hematology um, because my platelets spiked very high after a kidney infection. I was within a fortnight of taking chemo for a leukemia-related illness, and then my platelets dropped of their own accord. It was just my body overreacting to three lots of antibiotics due to the kidney infection. If there was somebody somewhere, please, recording and cataloguing the evidence we now have of possibly, I will say that, possibly permanent post-interferon or post-treatment and post-infection, that would be such a help. Just to pick that up with you, Jane. Sorry to no, drop it in no, there, but I was scared of losing just give me it. One, one, one moment. Yes, thank you very much. It, just to pick that up, it, it, it's a little bit more than that, though, that you've had, isn't it? In 2010, you had a possible transient ischemic attack, mini-stroke. Yes. 2013, you had a kidney infection requiring three courses of antibiotics. That's when you had the very high white cell count and abnormal bone marrow biopsy, yeah. and the doctors thought you may have some form of leukemia. Yeah. And t d December 2017, you had what seemed to be like flu, but you were then left with very severe fatigue thereafter. Yeah. And, and since then, you've been unable to work yeah. because it's been so severe. Yeah. You don't know whether they are related to hepatitis C, but you wonder, as you said, whether there is a link either with the hepatitis C or with the treatment you've received. Yeah. I just want to... Sorry to interrupt the flow. Not at all. Uh, <laughs> not at all. What, it's, it's such an important uh, piece, uh, Joan. I want to just read part of your statement and, and ask you to uh, uh, confirm it or, or comment further on it. Uh, you've said, uh, whether these symptoms and others were as a result of the interferon or the hepatitis C, I do not know. I just know that I've not been well since the blood transfusion, and I used to be a very fit and determined person. Uh, I knew that the treatment and side e had side effects, but the possibility of long-term or possibly permanent side effects were never discussed with me. Uh, I know that there was enough research in the US for them to have doubts about the treatment and I'm not aware of any information being withheld from me but if you don't know the questions to ask it's difficult to say uh, and yeah. you now reflect uh, whether you would have pushed so hard for the treatment if you'd known about the effect of it in a longer term sense is that right? Yes and, and thank you for that prompt it <laughs> Nothing happens in isolation, and if I just give you um, a thumbnail sketch. I knew I was infected. I was aware it, it was impacting on me in unknown ways. I was single parent. Um, my mum died when I was 22, 23. I had two girls approaching that age, and I was just absolutely determined to be well. So with the help of my very supportive GP, um, we were looking for treatments. I even started looking at what it would cost to do that privately, um, because I was aware that all the treatments seemed to be linked to trials, and then it was just potluck if a trial was being run in your area and you qualified for the treatment. Um, through my GP, he heard of a trial. 
that originally was a three drug treatment um, and I just missed the boat <laughs> that was closed then Taunton were given the chance of running the interferon ribavirin treatment and originally I'd had a biopsy that had shown I'd been impacted by hep C but if I wanted to qualify for this chance on this treatment I would need another biopsy which <laughs> is not um, a pleasant process we went through that and found that my scoring was just below the benchmark to qualify for the treatment so again was I going to get treated I to this day, I'm not sure why, but I did get on the trial. I think it's partly because I was pushing so hard um, and keen, but mainly because somebody dropped out because they were too ill. Now, my logic, and my GP had agreed, was if you can have treatment early enough, it's going to be more successful. If only because your body is able to cope with the treatment. A lot of the trials, people had to be really ill to qualify for. And these treatments are tough, or they were. Um, but for whatever reason, I got on the trial and I felt very fortunate. Before you got on the trial, you say, I began to get angry with the mindset that it was somehow OK to have hepatitis C because it wouldn't kill you. That was coming from people who didn't have hepatitis C. Yeah. I, I really think, <laughs> at one point, I do remember meeting this particular brick wall again and um, being made to feel almost neurotic that I was trying to push for treatment. Um, I did have it explained to me that there was only a 50-50 chance that it is tough, that there were side effects, um, and even today, they use the term long-term side effect, but the implication that that is only within the treatment and then a recovery period, that I have yet to find mention of permanent side effects. You got onto that trial, uh, mm -hmm. and it was a 52 weeks of interferon and ribavirin mm -hmm. that you underwent. How did you feel physically during that treatment? Um, in a way, coming here this week and listening, and it is also something that's part of this whole fabulous process, is the validation. Um, it was tough. I started off, again relatively well bearing in mind my heart goes out to half the people I've heard just because they were so poorly by the time they were facing these treatments they'd been living with liver problems I truly mean it when I say I was lucky if it had to happen I was lucky that my liver was still healthy because I managed the first four yeah, the, the first four weeks, I was thinking, I can do this. I'd enrolled on a part-time art course, save my sanity. <laughs> Always wanted to do art. Um, you get into a routine where you inject yourself once a week and you've got tablets to take. The interferon, the injection, would give you flu-like symptoms, which other people have confirmed. And I worked out a system where... I knew that I would be feeling rough for at least three days. I did homemade soup, fresh bread, had that in the fridge, so limited effort in eating. I was by my... There's a whole chunk, isn't there? There's layers and layers to this. I was by then living on my own by choice. Both my girls, thank goodness, were off in their independent life, uni... I deliberately didn't want them to know because I did know this was going to be tough. And in a way, I apologise now because they're catching up. <laughs> um, yeah, they, so, they were out of the house. Exactly. You would fill the fridge with soup and bread. Yep. yep. 
totally and, doable. I and, and at what time would you give yourself the injection, Jane? Um, one of the elements of all of this that caused me distress was the lack of control. So I played a bit of a game where I could go right up to midnight before I injected myself. That was my choice. I had the choice when on that day I would inject myself. And it's silly to say it now, but for some reason that seemed important. Um, and your statement says, I used to wait until one minute before in midnight to inject myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you go to bed, and that's also a way of short-circuiting some of the not feeling so well, because hopefully you're asleep. Um, you, you love to read, don't you, yeah. Joan? But during the treatment, there were times when you couldn't even do that. I, I started this trial with a group of people, some of whom just had to do the six months. And I do remember getting to six months and realising I had a whole another six months to go. Um, and that was bleak. By then, my body was really struggling. I think technically, my platelets and everything else that they looked at were fine. My body was obviously under stress, but there was no clinical reason to stop, so I was determined to keep going. But by then, the symptoms had intensified. Um... My eyes, I wouldn't need another prescription, but the ability to focus, find focus and read, would come and go. So I couldn't get lost in novels, which, when I was really poorly, was something that was something I liked to do. So you described setting up a chair in front of the window where you could simply sit and look out at nature. Yeah. And that, that was another thing. Part of the um, contraindications is you've got to be very careful about sunlight. And I keep myself sane by walking and being out in nature. Um, so if I went out during bright sunlight, it was hat, long sleeves, sunscreen. Um, or, and I thought this was quite smart, I'd go out really early in the morning or in the evening. Um, but there were times when I needed to be outdoors but couldn't really walk. So then the next best thing was to sit by the window. Uh, you also had substantial hair loss and uh, numb toes and fingers and you still have some residual partial numbness. Yeah. And the hair hasn't grown back on the nape of my neck and it's a minor thing but when people then say there's no evidence of permanent um, damage, actually there is. Perhaps we're just not looking in the right places. Emotionally, it's been very difficult as well. Uh, and more recently, you were seen by your GP and a counsellor and they diagnosed you with PTSD. Do you feel able to say any more about that? I do. Um, and this is what I mean about life... Things don't happen in isolation, do they? Goodness knows how this set of combination of events could ever have come together, but my lovely... He was on holiday in Somerset. Became critically ill with pancreatitis and landed up in the hospital that not only I was operated on, but that I had my treatment in. Um, the impact of the stress of worrying about him, I think, was part of the trigger, but I did walk down a corridor. Most, quite a lot of the hospital is now changed. Um, so I approached the hospital and it felt like a new place. But every now and then you turn the corner and you're in the same old corridor. And um, I'd never experienced this before, but it isn't even an intellectual process. It's, it's a sheer body impact of... Um, 
It manifests as shaking and sweating, um, a sense of dread, and you don't quite know what, where the danger is coming from. Um, I thought perhaps I was... Well, I didn't know what I thought. I had to go and sit in the loo for a while. Um, that happened on one occasion when I walked down a corridor and then I realised it had been my route to the chemo ward, which is where my treatment had been run. And then another night I was with... Um, he was actually sleeping quite peacefully. But he has learning difficulties, so we had to... Or we took rotor change so that if he woke up, he wouldn't start pulling out his tubes. That was fine. We were dealing with that. But then the crash button alarm went for somebody else. And just that noise. I had another visit to the toilet <laughs> to shake. And you've uh, had some counselling. You've had three blocks of counselling over the years. But on each occasion, there's been a very long wait between the referral and actually getting to see the counsellor. Yeah. yeah. I just want to go back to when you were undergoing the treatment. Um, you uh, claimed incapacity benefit while you were undergoing the treatment and for the year after when you were recovering. And you were required to go for a medical assessment during that time. Uh, can you tell us what happened during that first assessment? Um, the first assessment... I believe was after the six-month benchmark, so I know I'm struggling. Um, a friend very kindly drove me to the appointment... And it, it, it was a tremendous effort just to get there. Um, and I got ready for the battle, went in, and was actually seen by a GP, and I don't know if everybody is anymore. And the first thing he said as I sat down, he said, I'm terribly sorry. Had I seen your file before, you would not have been called in. And I'd been ready for a fight. And there he was being nice, so I burst into tears. <laughs> and what did he advise you do? Um, he advised that I talk to whoever was in charge of my treatment and get them to write a letter. Which they did? They did. But you were still called for a second assessment? Yes. Uh, and the uh, DWP insisted on assessing you during the year that you were um, supposed to be recovering and you found the whole benefit system uh, horrendous. Yes. I, um, I have professionally supported people claiming benefits um, and been their supportive other and seen them struggle. I'd never expected to be in that position myself. Um, at best, even if you are treated with common courtesy and politeness, it is a difficult place to find yourself in. Um, but I did on one occasion have quite a difficult conversation with a woman who basically said, well, it's not chemo. What's the problem? You've said, I hadn't perceived myself as having a lot of pride, but the one thing I did pride myself on was being resilient, and I found the whole process of applying for benefits and attending the assessments really demeaning. Yeah. A year after you'd finished treatment, um, you couldn't face another assessment and so you decided to find some part-time work. You went to your GP to ask when you'd receive confirmation of having cleared the virus because you, you had cleared the virus yes. uh, and whether you had to tell employers about it. Uh, what else did you say to the GP at that point? 
do you know, I've, I've, I've got sidetracked by some other memories, so I'm not quite That's sure okay. what we're Don't referring worry. to um, there. You, you, you've said in your statement, you also asked, who's going to employ me now? Oh, yes, bless him. Um, if I put that all into context, I had... Um, having had to give up the youth work post and whilst I was waiting for treatment I'd cobbled together various jobs and I had found one project job that I'd really loved and then I'd had to give that up because of the treatment um, there was a real issue for me about employment because I have people skills I work for the government in teaching youth work and the criteria about offering up your medical history is just a given. Um, prior to this completion of the treatment, I'd already experienced issues about having hep C, feeling I would have to declare it. Um, and I know, because it's a small work uh, network within the people working field, that there's at least two jobs that I didn't get because of hep C. Um, so here I am, out the other side of a really horrendous couple of years, talking to my GP and just basically saying, feeling I had this battle again. At what point? You see, sorry, I'm interrupting myself, but one of the hard things with the treatment, you do not get a certificate and, well done, madam, you are now clear. We slipped into a limbo of we have to wait to see if it might not come back. So... It was years before I actually got to the point where I could say, I have absolutely cleared hep C. But you went to your GP to ask that question. I did. And said, who's going to employ me now? And he said he would. So you went to work for the GP yep. as a receptionist in the surgery? You've uh, since had to give that up because the fatigue is simply too much. Yes, this is now a different surgery and I've moved and things have happened, but because of that kind man, I had another career in which I was accepted. I've only ever been able to work part-time, but I have worked through every single health thing until now. Um, and, yeah, it was a job. Believe it or not, it was a job I enjoyed because I was the right side of the table to deal with people who were struggling. As you spoke a moment ago, you alluded to having <coughs> tried to apply for work involving young people in the 1990s, in that yeah. hiatus between having been diagnosed and having your treatment and not getting those jobs. Can you tell us a little bit more about what happened then? Um... <laughs> I found myself in the position where I wasn't too sure about my health there was quite a lot of project work going on at the time and I applied for one which would have been short term and was in fact basically overqualified for um, knew somebody on the panel who afterwards very kindly <laughs> took me to one side and said you were doing really well it was just a question of your health and actually I took that on the chin because I thought that particular project maybe that was fair it would have been really intense um, so the next job I remember applying for would have been <sighs> I think it was two days face-to-face -face and a day admin reporting for whatever it was, 18 months. Um, and I think it was somebody on the panel actually raised the question of my health and energy, which surprised me, but thinking on my feet I said thank you very much for asking that question because I can affirm that you know, I'm doing okay <laughs> all words to that effect but no I didn't get that job either 
Uh, Nobody actually said anything like, are you infectious, are you this, are you that? But it was definitely an issue. But off the record, you were told uh, that you'd not got the job because of your hepatitis C. Uh, as you say, you, you went to work for your own GP after treatment, yes. uh, for your own GP as a receptionist, and then on to other similar types of part-time role. Yeah. You've obviously never returned to the outward-bound youth work no. No. because of your ill health. Uh, and you've said in your statement, it, it took me a long time to let go of the hopes and dreams that I shared with my peer group. Uh, you play the cards you've been dealt and make the best of everything, but it's hard not to grieve about what could have been. Yes. Um, again, if I use some in imagery, where I am now, on lots of levels, I count my blessings regularly. Um, but it's within the context and the image in my head for a long time, I don't know if anybody ever saw it, was of somebody trying to cross the Grand Canyon on a tightrope. As long as I remain balanced, so not overdo it, not overstress, not overcommitted, I can remain upright and have a pretty good life with a lovely view. But it takes effort even just to do that, of concentration, of monitoring, of keeping as steady as I can. And my family will know that's quite tricky because I'm quite a spontaneous person and likely to say yes when I should say no to stuff. Um, and I'm now of a certain age where just becoming older is having an impact. Where in the past a bit of determination, a bit of steady keep fit, watch your diet, everything else would see me through. The reason I'm not working now is I had bad flu 2017 and it's taking me this long to get to a point where I can commit to maybe going away on holiday because what you deal with all the time is just not knowing quite how the day's going to end. Um, it is incredibly easy to overdo it. If you can manage to just deplete yourself and deplete yourself but stop, then yes, rest, and I can just about get on with the next day. If for any reason you have to push yourself, like going home tonight's going to be tricky because I don't know if it's a long journey, we get delayed. If I go into what we call deficit, then that's a week in bed. And but am I glad I'm alive? Yes, I am. And so many, so, so many aren't. And that impact, uh, that hasn't just impacted you, it's impacted your daughters as well. Uh, you've said in your uh, statement that your eldest daughter thought she'd taken it all in her stride, but she'd left home by then. I, yeah, and I need to say now, I can't answer for them, and I would encourage them to make a statement, because with all honesty, I don't know the impact it's had on them. But from your perspective, you've watched them have a, 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 a mum who's not been well. I tried really, really hard to save them most of the story. <sighs> it's hard enough for no reason of your own to be deflected from a career where you really felt you were making a difference oh don't put makeup on I can't cry <laughs> <laughs> it is hard enough to be deflected from a career that you really put effort into choosing training for and felt you were making a difference but then to not be able to be the parent and grandparent you'd hope to be is beyond. I can't give you the words for that. I want to go back to somewhere that we yeah. were talking about a little while ago and pick up something you said uh, before. 
earlier when you were talking to us, you said that you wished that somebody had looked more broadly at the long-term permanent impact of the hepatitis C. Yeah. You've since uh, recent, more recently had copies of your medical records. And in those records, there was a document we can have up, 0065009. It's dated the 3rd of July, 1998. And can we highlight the first paragraph to begin with? <coughs> this is a letter uh, from... Uh, a, 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 a doctor to your a G but sorry let me double check before I say something uh, I think this was to the consultant yes. that's exactly it's yes. to your consultant apologies yeah. uh, it's uh, to your consultant and it says at the top as relatively little is known about uh, HCV infection transmission or the clinical course of the resultant disease a national register of HCV infections is being created uh, funded by the Department of Health and will provide a facility for the future monitoring and long-term assessment of HCV infection within the UK and then the third paragraph please uh, Paul Uh, I've enclosed an information sheet explaining the purposes of the registry, which you may like to pass to your patient. Uh, no patient will be contacted directly. Uh, however, this information sheet's been provided for clinicians who feel they'd like to notify their patients of their inclusion in the register. And it's explained uh, that the register will include information on all patients who've become infected with hepatitis C, on a known date and it will gather information on other people who are definitely not infected. Uh, were you ever informed that you uh, had been added to the register? No. Or even as to the existence of the register? No. Then if we go over to the third page, that third paragraph, It says, uh, the National Register will gather information. When the Public Health Laboratory Network identifies a patient who could be included in the register, they'll contact the doctor who cares for that patient and invite them to include their patient in the register. Your doctor can then pass information, but not your name, from your medical records to the register in order to advise us of your state of health he, she can also keep us updated with your progress. Um, were you ever told whether further information about you from your medical records uh, has since been passed on? No, but this piece of paper then made sense of something else that had happened in my life in that I was approached in about 94... No, it must have been after... 96, whenever it was, by um, the group that were taking that first action that eventually ended in the Skipton Fund. And I did join that process, but I at no point had looked to join. Um, life was too full. <laughs> I wouldn't it had not even crossed my mind to look at sort of litigation or anything. So somehow, somewhere, my name had been shared. And I don't remember even how I was approached, whether it was a telephone call. I eventually had a letter and liaised locally with Clarks and Son, and they were linked with whoever was organising the action. And your belief is that the... The, the lawyers found your name through the HCV register? It would, as far as I know, that's the only register I'm on. <laughs> so I would assume that is the link. But you've never been told that you were on the register? No, I and haven't. you've never been told uh, that your medical information is being provided to anyone no. else? No, I've not seen that paperwork before I saw my notes. 
just, just by way of observation, the information sheet says the register itself is totally anonymous, as no names are recorded within it. If that is correct, uh, then it could not have been the source of the information. It must have come from somewhere else. Um, but the other letter shows that the GP holds the code still. So, yes, I, I honestly don't know. I don't know. Thank That's you. the only register I'm aware of where my information well, has been Somebody shared. somewhere passed your name to the person who wrote about you, plainly. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, I had no sense of the significance of that at the time. And uh, just as a matter of... Uh, of interest, I don't know if you are able to tell me, but was this before or after the coming into force of the Data Protection Act? It's just around about the time that the Data Protection Act was coming into force. Uh, I'm looking. I'm looking behind me at, to Mr. Locke because we we raised that exact point between us uh, yesterday. So I think the Data Protection Act was passed in 1998, well I'm sure it was passed in 1998 because I was there when it was passed, um, and um, uh, it came into effect in 2000. So um, the, uh, uh, this letter was sent at a time when the directive was in force, and, and obviously this is a government body and therefore it's, it's of direct effect, but before the implementing UK legislation was implemented. Thank you very much. At the very least, in your own mind, there are questions about how your name came to find its way to yes. somebody else in the litigation field. Yes. <coughs> Financially, uh, things have been difficult for you, uh, and uh, particularly in relation to having to claim benefits and not being able to work to the extent you would have liked. Uh, have you ever applied for insurance? No, is Why the not? short answer. <laughs> um, part of the reasoning that I even joined the original litigation was that I became aware how little I knew. One of the useful bits of information, and I do mean that, that came through was, and this is me, my interpretation of what I read, was hold fire on requesting any insurance because within the time frame historically the hep C was being lumped in with the HIV and it was the time of all the negative publicity and I was informed that insurance companies were counting them as one and the same and if I had a refusal on an application that would carry forward to any other application. Uh in terms of financial assistance, you've received a payment from the Skipton Fund. Yes. But then you weren't aware of the England Infected Blood Support Scheme until the inquiry was announced. Yeah. Uh, how did you come to hear about it? Um, thank heavens for Facebook and the networking. Um, I dug out my folder that still had the Skipton information and emailed just wanting to know what the current state of affairs was and within that and I didn't think to print it off um, it was basically stated that <laughs> they hadn't passed on my information to this new body because I had never granted them the authority to do so which is good but then they didn't contact me to tell me they needed my authority so nothing got passed and how did that make you feel I realize I must be quite punch drunk with all of this now because I just remember laughing I mean how ridiculous is that and uh, since then you have uh, applied to the EIBSS and have received at some uh, payments. But how do you feel about the process of applying uh, for financial assistance? <clears throat> um, it feels like the benefit system again, in that above and beyond the basic payment, anything else, you need to fill out forms, you need GPs to qualify and state how ill you are 
or not. Um, and it comes back to one of my original points, which was this thing of if nobody is recording our chronic fatigue-like symptoms, there is no recognition of them as a condition. If you don't tick the right box on the conditions list, then you don't get benefits. You don't get the next notch up. Uh, you've described the process as incredibly humiliating and demeaning. My feeling is if that they've decided that we qualify for some kind of compensation support, they should stop making us jump through the hoops to get it. Yes. And you're left, you're left in this position where if... To be left with any modicum of sort of um, dignity... If I go out of my front door, I hold my head up, I dress well, and I try and present well. If you turn up at a benefit office like that, you're immediately disqualified. So what do I do? Do I then go in, still upright, but then tell them of the bad days? To tell them of the bad days is doable but you're talking to a stranger. You're talking to somebody who has no concept of what I mean when I say I'm having a bad day. To them, maybe that means they stub their toe. To me, that means I'm in pain, my joints ache, I'm potentially running a temperature. If I push it, I will get the shakes. If I push that beyond that threshold, um, I have issues with body temperature regulation so I can go cold or hot if I push that then I'm in bed and you feel that the process to obtain uh, payments or, or different levels of payments from the EIVSS it is the same system and requirements that are on you there because they're looking for the same clinical tick box exercise and no I do not have lupus and no I do not have ME and no I do not have MS I cannot tick your box for you madam is what I land up saying but no that does not mean I'm fit to work currently I've worked really hard to get back to a certain level of fitness the only reason I haven't been able to return to my job is what I cannot do is guarantee to you that every morning for my nine o'clock shift, I can turn up and do five hours. Joan, those are the questions I have for you. Is there anything else you would like to say? Thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to turn my back uh, and ask uh, Mr Locke if there's anything else. Just one more thing, Joan. Um, Mr Locke would like me to raise. Uh, do you feel that anyone uh, should act as a care coordinator given that uh, hepatitis C produces so many different symptoms? It, it loops back, Sir Brian, to what I was trying to say. Um, I don't quite know how we resolve this, but just by the sheer weight of numbers, thank goodness for this inquiry that so many people are able to come forward and tell their stories. But just in this first week, I've heard enough, I've had enough personal validation around these non-specific symptoms that has no label, but that I begin to feel is connected with either the impact of having set, had hep C, even if it's now cleared, and or the treatment that I had to clear it. If there is no 
um, no one body or anybody ever trying to collate that information. It remains anecdotal. If it remains anecdotal and not clinical, it can be disregarded by the benefit people and everybody else. Thank you. Can I just take a moment, sir, to check one other matter? There's a second matter that I think I did ask you, but we can't instantly find it on the transcript. So if I have, I apologise. Uh, but um, now you know about the data being passed to the National Register, uh, how do you feel about the NHS having data about you? That's a good question. There are so many layers to everybody's story. Um, fundamentally, I do not want to damage the NHS. I am no longer angry. What I would like is to know that things are done with integrity, that the core of it is caring for the patient, so to say, no, there should be no registers, no. But please ask us. Please let us know why and what's going to happen to it. Because that was another thing, actually, that it's just reminded me. I joined the medical trial um, because I wanted to be well, but then had a naive expectation that I would get some idea of feedback. How did it go? What was the outcome? What were the results? and was quite surprised to get the impression that even the people um, processing me through this didn't really quite know where every, the information was going. Maybe the consultant did, but the person that you see on your day-to-day -day clinical, how are you, whatever. Um, and I did ask several times, just out of interest, no other reason, you know, did it help? What were the results? Never found out. Thank you. Uh, Joan, um, can I just say this? Uh, a number of times during your evidence, you've been reminded of something. Uh, it's obvious that you have a lot in mind which you haven't perhaps yet told us or remembered. If, uh, when you go home tonight or over the next couple of weeks, if you follow the inquiry or even if you don't, uh, something occurs to you which you would have wanted to say. Oh, thank Please you so don't, much. Please don't think that the time has passed. Let your solicitors know. Uh, Mr. Locke uh, and his team uh, will forward that on to the inquiry. It will be in writing because that's the way we take uh, material. But there is always space for you to add because thank it you. has struck me that you might have things that you wanted to add uh, and they slipped your mind as you've been telling us. Thank you, because the one word I didn't use, partly because everybody else has, brain fog. <laughs> and it, it's, it's amazing what the trigger will do that will then anchor me back to something. And I had not seen my notes until recently, and that in itself then gives me more information that I can recall. Um, I did, personally, an exercise of a timeline on a spreadsheet because part of the survival of the treatment and the process was to block it. So for a long time, there was me, and I'm OK, I'm, I'm, I'm surviving, and there was my poor old body having a heck of a time. And it's only when I do this spreadsheet and think, my goodness, at that point in the treatment, I was also dealing with X, Y, and Z. So I'll carry on with my spreadsheet, and I sincerely thank you for that. And I'd also like to thank your team. Goodness knows how you sit through all these stories. Bless you. 
Well, it's, it's us that should be thanking you for telling yours, so let me do that now. Thank you very much. Thank you. For what you've said and what you may yet say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, Ms. Fraser Butler, and that concludes the the evidence for today uh, and indeed for this week. It does, sir. And then on Tuesday, we will have three further witnesses. Now, can you tell us who they are? <laughs> we have. Uh, uh, we'll be hearing from Lauren Palmer, Fiona Rennie, and Michelle Tolly on Tuesday. Uh, and we will start then at ten thirty on Tuesday. I've already told you that we'll start at ten thirty next week. Now, there's a slight change to that. Let me explain. It's going to be 10.30 on Tuesday, 10.30 on Wednesday. It'll be 10 o'clock. Now, that on Thursday, that's for reasons of witness convenience. Uh, and it'll be 10 o'clock on Friday. That's because I, I know that uh, some of you may well be staying over, uh, and it makes it easier for you to get home in time for the weekend. So, 10.30, Tuesday, Wednesday, 10 o'clock uh, on Thursday, Friday. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing as many of you as w would like to be here uh, on Tuesday.